Welcome to Culinary Chats with Indulge Boise. I'm your host, Angela Taylor. I'm also the owner and chief indulge officer at Indulge Boise. And we are so excited to be here in the space today with you fellow food enthusiasts. As I've talked about on the show, uh, this is a creation that is really a dedication to you all, the foodies here in Idaho, just to get to know about the culinary industry, those faces and spaces and places that have had a huge imprint and influence on what's happening as we are experiencing this emerging culinary scene here in Idaho and Boise and the Treasure Valley specifically. And so on our show, we are really excited to be in conversation on a regular basis, um, talking to innovative chefs from Idaho and beyond, the visionary entrepreneurs and restaurateurs who are opening up a plethora of new concepts on a regular basis here in Idaho some passionate brewers, dedicated farmers, and anyone along the food chain and the the food ecosystem, if you will, that have an impact on our experience as diners in the restaurants here in the Treasure Valley. And I'm really excited today to be in conversation with someone who has had a tremendous influence on me and the vision that I had for Indulge Boise. Quite often I get asked uh, about you know, what inspired me to start Indulge Boise? And I share a few different stories. Uh, One was the fact that when I moved back to Idaho, I wanted to find a way to share the story about Idaho and to connect people to each other and to the different neighborhoods uh, and the story that I had learned growing up in Idaho. But I also was inspired by an experience that I had in New York City um, with a really good friend of mine who is, is today's special guest. Uh, and had a chance to go to some of the best restaurants in the world, certainly in New York City, and just sit back like a fly on the wall and watch these chefs talk about the food and the menus that they were curating, the ingredients they were using, the wines that they would pair it with, listening to the sommelier talk about that, listening to them talk about the ingredients and where they had sourced them from around the world. And it was like listening to people speak French or Italian. You know how that is. When you listen to someone speak a different language, how beautiful it was. Well, that was the case for me as I was privileged enough and honored to be able to sit at the table with Victor Scargo, today's guest, and some of the top chefs in New York City at the time, as they talked about the food that was on the menu at restaurants like Gramercy Tavern. And it changed my life uh, in many different ways. And that experience has a huge influence on the experiences that we curate with Indulge Boise. And so it is truly an honor and a privilege today. This is one of the things I wanted to have early on uh, once we launched Culinary Chats. I wanted to have a conversation with Victor to find out a little bit about his journey, to find out how he perceives the culinary scene here in Idaho and what it is like to be a guest chef on Top Chef. So without further ado, I want you all to to have the chance to hear from Victor and less about me. Um, But without further ado, I would love to introduce you to my dear friend, Victor Scargo. Victor Scargo, a California native, is widely recognized as one of the most renowned chefs in Northern California's Napa Valley. Victor is currently the executive chef of the property at Grayton Resort and Casino in Rohnert Park, California, and is a private chef and hospitality consultant. Prior to this, Victor was the executive chef and food and beverage director at Estate Yountville. He was the culinary director at Boise Collection, France's third largest wine group and the biggest wine producer in Burgundy. Victor's portfolio also includes being executive chef at the Culinary Institute of America, Copia, Bartizona, Julia's Kitchen at the Copia, Go Fish, Jardiner, Pisces, and several other concepts. Now, while Victor calls Northern California his home, his food has been showcased at high profile events and impressive venues around the world. Thanks for tuning in today as we share some food for thought in a soulful conversation with Victor Scargo. Victor, welcome to Culinary Chats with Indulge Boise. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, we, we shared a little bit about your bio, and I know there were several other extraordinary experiences that you had on your culinary journey prior to, to that. Um, but tell us a little bit about like what you're up to these days. So right now, we're um, I'm the property chef at Great Resort and Casino in Roner Park, California. So it's a uh, 
Um, I'd only been there once before I interviewed. So I went, went back to see it again. I was really impressed with what they were doing and what their vision was. So we're in the middle of an expansion. So right now we've got two restaurants, a steakhouse and an Italian restaurant. We're about to reopen uh, a concept that was Daily Grill, but now we're taking that over and going to open Bistro 101. Uh, it be kind of a gastro pub where we'll have breakfast for the locals as well, you know, high-end breakfast, sourcing local ingredients, uh, and then get into kind of fun gastro pub type of food, the food that we like to eat. So the menu planning has been been really exciting, and we're really looking forward to that. At the same time, they're expanding the parking garage, they're expanding the gaming floor, we're going to do a rooftop restaurant, there's lots of things happening. So we're nonstop busy on a regular basis. So it's been really exciting time and it's been great to be part of a, the growth process. It's been a while since I've been part of a, an opening like with our new concept and and seeing the expansion. So there's lots of moving parts for sure. It keeps us busy. Well, you talk about the growth process and it really feels like over the last seven, five to seven years, at least maybe even 10 years, there has been this explosion in the foodie culture. Uh, mm. So there's a lot of new restaurants coming online. There's a lot of concepts similar to what you're doing uh, there in Roanoke Park. When you started this journey, which I believe you were a teenager, uh, when you started the, in getting into the culinary industry, could you even foresee where you would be today and what would be going on in this landscape? Not not really. You know, and it's kind of funny because I grew up in Aptos or Santa Cruz County or Central Coast, for those that don't know California and the, the restaurant I worked at, you mentioned 13 and a half. I worked at one restaurant briefly um, where my parents used to go all the time and it was kind of a grill your own steak place. And so that was my job at an early age. And then I went to another place that had a, it was called the greenhouse restaurant at the farm. And the owner was there and there was a farm on property and a bakery and a gift shop. And it was scratch. Everything was pretty much from scratch. And, um, because of, I guess my passion and wanting to show up and listening, I very quickly became a key player in that at a, as a teenager, you know, running the line on a, on a weeknight by myself, you know, cooking steaks and fish and sort of in charge of, of what the guests were, were getting, you know, but even before that I had a, interest in cooking. My dad cooked. Uh, um, you know, I remember going to a community college cooking class for kids in Aptos and um, always enjoyed it. You know, I still have a, a tattoo from early days of making sugar cookies from the, the coil in the oven and uh, at home where I touched it and it burned me. So, but there's many more to cover that up since then, but I always, I always enjoyed it, you know, and I think for most uh, cooks, my age or around it, you got into it because uh, the intensity, the passion and what you can deliver to somebody. You know, I, I heard someone say it the other day and I've always said it is like, we're not saving anybody's life. We have, depending on the space, a window where we can give somebody escape from their day, uh, can celebrate happiness or give them escape from whatever hardship they're going through. So let's work hard to make them forget about whatever woes they're having or never forget the celebration that they had with us. So that's, that's start to finish. You know, there's a lot of great uh, front of the house people, you know, and we went, you mentioned Gramercy Tavern, Danny Meyer, who's a restaurateur in New York. I've read his book, setting the table. I don't know how many times or listened to it on audiobook because some of the things that he mentioned are like the standard in hospitality, like with all the tools we have this day, when Angela Taylor walks to the front door, we should know who she is, what her animals' names are, what she likes to eat, what her allergies are. And, you know, to some point it can become creepy, but if it's to make a guest experience better, then why not? You know, know that she likes sparkling water versus still. Don't have to ask, you know, doesn't like butter, likes oil with her bread or, you know, all those little things makes people feel appreciated. And when times are tough and money is tough and tight, you know, sometimes... And it takes a long time as a chef to realize this, that the front of the house, the service experience and what happens in the dining room floor is oftentimes more important than the food that's coming out. And, you know, it's, it's, you want to get upset about it or whatever, but if, you know, the old, the old school of yelling in the kitchen or whatever, then you've got this, this server, a waiter, a waitress, that's all uptight and, and go on the floor. The guests can feel that, you know, and sometimes they can hear it. So, you know, the goal is to really make someone have an unforgettable experience positively or negatively. Um, so they want to come back, right? You know, hi, how are you doing? Greet them on the way in, greet them on the way out. I've worked for some, with some amazing pastry chefs. So it's like, if we made, if we fumbled the ball in the middle of the meal, I knew 
come dessert, we were in good shape because they were going to have something that was just mind blowing and dessert. So um, from an early age, was really passionate about it. And I found some great mentors along the way. You know, when I was uh, down in Santa Barbara, I was missing being in the kitchen and the adrenaline going to class with 800 or a thousand other people in some of these classes and really missed that adrenaline and got connected with a chef named Brian Bird, who was down at the Fest Parker at the time, Red Lion Resort. And he really kind of sent me on my way. I could have just stayed there for a while, but he's like, you, you need to find somewhere else, find a good chef. You know, it's not going to be easy, um, but we'll find them somewhere where you want to live. And, and he sent me on my way, you know, and that's how I ended up in Miami beach, you know, California kid. I'd never been there before. And uh, he, you know, basically said, you need to go. Made a phone call, never even met the chef before I arrived in Miami Beach in August. It was humidity like you can, it was, <laughs> it was, it was humid. <laughs> anyway, you get off an air conditioned car and you're like, okay, we're, it's different weather out here. But it was amazing. Different food, different people, you know, people from Eastern Europe, Haitian, uh, the islands around there, whole different style of food than California, fresh, local, same as like we're doing in California, but from the islands, you know, different, different stuff. So it, it I mean, it, it started, you know, before 13 and a half, probably at, at the time, way back when you could work when you were 13 and a half. Now I think it's 16, which I don't know, as an old, old school person, I, I don't know how I feel about that. Like, how do you, you know, but then how do you study? How do you do sports, you know, when you're working and, and I don't know, but it, it for me, I learned really early on, uh, from the owner of the restaurant, there was a time when I was pouting and, you know, and felt I deserved more money. And, and he, he kind of kept his dis. He taught me something. I mean, I was probably 15, maybe 16 at the time. And we finally sat down and talked and he goes, look, you do deserve more money, but the way you're going about it, you can't pout, you know, let's just sit down and talk about it. And I've, oh, I've never forgotten that. You know, it's like, you know, you got to have a conversation with somebody. You can't pout. And you know, so many lessons I learned early on, you know, and then um, went up to New York the first time. That was in 93. Um, then went back in 97, but worked for Michael Mina uh, 90, starting in 95. And wow, what a that was watching him start the empire that he has today. You know, I, I don't know how many restaurants and stuff he has now. I think it's between 20 and 30 around the world at the time it was it was kind of one that he was operating and then that started to expand and then got to travel around the world with him we went to singapore and we went to chiang mai we went to super bowl events and really just kind of got to sit back and learn a lot from him by being in a back seat you know just watching you know media training things that i was assisting him with openings um whatever it was i had a the, the timing couldn't have been perfect for me to really soak up what he was doing. It's incredible. As I listen to that story in your journey, it stands out that there have been so many people who have had an influence on your journey along the way. And when we think about the, the culinary industry, it seems like it's so vast, right? There's a restaurant yeah. in every corner um, and in every city, in every country around the globe. But it sounds like it is a, actually a really small sorority or fraternity of people. Exactly, and if you exactly. are able to be plugged in to the right people, that that is gonna be something that is gonna be the catalyst for the success that you've experienced. And, and I mentioned in your bio, one of the, the best chefs in the world, like right, literally, like you've been known as one of the best chefs in the world and have been recognized for that. Who were some of the chefs that inspired you and how important is, is it for you to get plugged in to that network yeah. of chefs? I th it's very important. You know, for me, I didn't go to culinary school. I taught at um, one of the best culinary schools in the country after that, but it was, it was vital for me. And it was, um, it's, it is a very small network. You know, we recently did a charity event and had a lot of people around and, and, you know, Michael Mina was there and, you know, the people that had met, 30 years ago were there and there were some new faces that he'd met and it's a small network. And, and if, even if you don't know him, like when you're looking at a resume, I can look at a resume and go, Oh, you worked for Michael Mina for a year and a half. Well, that means you've got some chops because you made it through. You didn't work there for a month. You didn't make it through three months. You, you went through the growing pains. You learned the system 
and and now you've got something of value to to bring to our team you know and and so I went from Miami to New York. I worked for Douglas Rodriguez. He had previously worked in Florida with the guy that I worked for in Florida. Uh, my friend in Florida went up there. Then I uh, wanted to move back to California, interviewed with some different people. I got off the plane on a Friday night and went into the kitchen at Aqua. This is 1995. So it was, you know, it was booming, you know, and, and just walking to the kitchen, the adrenaline or whatever. And, you know, he, he pulled one on me and is like, you know, you got to take the job now. Otherwise, you're not going to get it. And I was like, well, I have six other interviews planned in the next two days. And he's like, nope, you got to take it right now. And, you know, I was young. I was like, all right. I, you know, I, was, I got caught up in it, you know, and, and I spent a long time with Michael and, and learned a lot. We had a lot of growing pains, but we did a lot of really cool things, you know. Um, and mo I think the biggest one was how how we opened the Aqua and Bellagio Hotel when it first opened. And that experience and the talent that he brought in to help with the opening, to make sure and cooking for Steve when, you know, a week before it was open as test runs and just all, all of it was, is really amazing. But everybody along the way, you know, Brian and Santa Barbara, Douglas, Robin Haas in Florida, you know, um, Michael Mina, you know, I spent a little bit of time with Tracy Desjardins in, in San Francisco and she was working on another project, but just the, the foundation that she laid and how she worked with products. She came from the Central Valley as well, the heartland of where things are grown for across the country. So how she handled a potato, a carrot, you know, how she made sauces, just this finesse that was there that was so different from what I had seen from like over reduced things or overcooking things or um it was just a finesse of how to treat these vegetables and proteins that, you know, are, are before, it was before it was like cool to say, well, we're getting all of our food from within 50 miles, you know, yeah. that's tough to do, you know, but she was doing a good job of that early on. I learned a lot from being there and then going on to run a, a big operation in the, uh, or actually before that was the Hotel Monaco and then Jardinier and then, and then ending up in Napa. Like I never saw myself being in Napa because I hadn't spent a lot of time here, but it's very similar to where I grew up. And, you know, I haven't been in Idaho for a long time, but um, I'm, I'm, my gut tells me it's very similar to, um, where, where I grew up, where there's lots of farmers and ranchers and, you know, that connection for me, you know, I've still, Don Watson's a gentleman who rose, uh, raised sheep in the area for a long time. Um, and he just taught me a lot about that whole process. Like we got to see him being born and, and when you, you go through that process, however you feel one way or the other, you've got a different respect for the animal you know, and, um, the, you know, they're born mom, mom can only feed so many babies. And me and a, a good friend of mine, Brian Barry, who worked together several times, we're out, out watching them being born. And we're like, Don, Don, that, that baby over there needs help. He's like, it's all right. So he grabbed a mom and the nutrition that was in the milk, man, that, that baby was up running around like nothing. And it just shows you the value of pure un human messed with food, you know, like, if you've had a tomato that's been still warm being picked off the vine or picked it yourself, it's very different than the refrigerated tomato that's in the grocery store in the wrong season. Um, you know, and I fight with, I fight with that all the time, whether it's in a hotel or the casino, people want fruit in the wrong season. They want, they want what they want, you know, and you can only educate them so much. So then how, how do we as chefs make it so it's more enjoyable, you know, to serve that in that time of year. But it, ment mentors are, it's everything. And right now I think it's even more important. I think there's chefs that are dying for people hungry to be in the industry with culinary programs, not in schools, not to get on a political soapbox, but you know, if, if people aren't exposed to it, like I was able to be exposed to it, then how are they going to know, you know, how are they going to know about wood shop or pottery or auto shop or the things that we, we were forced to do um, if they're not in, in the school, you know, especially when they have to wait, longer to get a job and then they're too busy and then they go to college and, and never get exposed to anything but the classroom. And I think it gives more well-rounded humans to, I was working with, I don't want to say adults because I don't know who in the restaurant industry is an adult, but they were, you know, 10 years <laughs> older than me. You know, as a 16 year old, I'm around 25, 30, you know, and there was some, some veteran waiters and wait staff in there too. It makes you grow up, you know, and you see them sometimes in resorts at the pool or, you know, bussers or whatever. But uh, I think in this country, you don't see it as much. You go to France or you go to Italy, 
I, like I remember going to France and seeing, you know, a young kid that's a buster that's he's working his way up, right? He wants to become the maitre d' one day in that restaurant. So he's hustling. He's learning everything. He's everything is just totally polished, you know, and they're on time and, and everything. And here it's like, you know, they show up to interviews and or don't show up say, oh, I forgot, you know, and, and uh, it would be great to see that kind of passion here. I don't know if it'll ever happen. We're, as far as culturally, we're a little bit behind uh, Europe as far as the passion for food, but there, there's still people out there, you know, we're interviewing people all the time and there's still people out there that are passionate about food and that's what we're hungry and looking for. And mentorship's everything, right? It's, it's all about connecting the dots. The reason why I went back to New York is because Michael Mina was friends with Don Pintabona, who was running Tribeca Grill. And Michael didn't have any projects that we're waiting. We're waiting for projects to happen. So he's like, go, go work for Don, get in New York and, and stage around the city. So, I mean, put basically I put my nose in as many restaurants as I could. So I would work. And then on my days off, I'd go put my nose in a kitchen, whether it was amazing pastry chef like Claudia Fleming at Gramercy Tavern or um, uh, La Bernadette, Les Panas. I mean, it was it was mind blowing the California kid going out there, even after my experience at Aqua to see what, what they were doing. Um, Rick, uh, you know, there's so many that I popped my head into and uh, it's just with everything the industry has been through, it's great to see that you know, there's still people making it and doing it and focused on the right thing. So that's, it's exciting. It is exciting. There's so many places that and directions that I can go from this. I, I want to center around that New York experience because I was the beneficiary of you just popping in and going to some of those restaurants. And again, it changed the way I thought about the restaurant experience or the dining experience. Before it was, I'm hungry. I don't want to cook. So let me go somewhere to get some food. And that interaction with you and watching you and your colleagues at work and listening to the conversation was like, this is an experience. It's not just about eating when you're hungry, but it's eating beautiful food, looking at the plating skills. It's thinking about the different ingredients, where they're being sourced, this conversation and this ecosystem that takes place, uh, not just in the restaurant, but beyond. And so it was a profound learning experience that has been etched in my journey for sure. But some of my favorite memories, uh, Victor, in New York uh, were where we would meet up on Saturdays was with our friends, Brett, um, Catherine. Mm -hmm. uh, we even invited uh, Beverly Oden, a volleyball player, to play with us as well. Um, but where we played hoops at uh, the world famous uh, sports club Reebok. And I, I wonder if those pickup hoops games that we played in, if that was somewhat of an outlet for you, considering mm -hmm. the intensity of the work that takes place in the restaurants. I'm always curious to, to hear, you know, what it's really like behind the scenes, back of house, the interaction between the back of house and the front of house for some of the best chefs in the world who are trying to not just put out great food, but the whole dining experience that you alluded to before for your guests. Uh, so is, do you need an outlet? Is that such an intense role that you're playing? Yeah, I think it's it's and and you've seen this around the world over the last few decades. You've seen chefs that have unfortunately, um, I don't know what the word is, not succumb, but 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 have so much mental stress. Right, it's an issue around around the world. It's very high stress, and the expectations are very stressful. And I've watched friends that have Michelin starred restaurants that try to open a restaurant and they don't want Michelin in there. They don't want the reviewers in there because they want to make their food. They want to make what the guest wants and what they want. And what happens sometimes is you get a, you get an award, you get, you get a, a star or, or whatever it is. And then you start cooking. This is, I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing what I've heard other people say, and I've felt it a little bit, but you start making what the reviewer wants, whether it's the San Francisco Chronicle around here, or, I mean, now everybody's a critic, Eater, Yelp, everybody's a critic. So we're all so afraid uh, to upset somebody, a lot of times people will come in and, and be like, I didn't like that. Comp my meal. And we're like, you know, it's just not worth the fight. I had to tell a general manager at, at Bartisono tell me, like, you think it's really worth me battling with this person over their omelet? No. You know, you don't want that negative press. So, um, yes, you need an outlet. In fact, that's a question when I get around some of the top chefs in the world. I, I remember asking uh, I did an event, I was fortunate to do an event when I was at Julia's Kitchen at Copia with Thomas Keller, French Laundry, you know, he's got a place in New York. He's, I mean, he's 
he he and Danny Meyer, I would say, are front of the house, back of the house, like artists. You know, they've they've figured out this business machine through everything. You know, we've had a lot of world things in, in your and my lifetime. Um, and it's been tough to navigate. Shut down, open up, shut down, open up. You know, we've had fires out here, you know, whatever it is. And I asked him, he, he pulled me out of the, we were doing this event together and I was like trying to make sure everything was perfect. And he's like, come on, let's go. And I'm like, I can't leave the kitchen right now. He's like, no, come on, let's go. They'll figure it out. And he just wanted to sit down and talk. And I was like, whoa, why, you know, why does he want to talk to me or whatever? He's like, what, you know, what do you got? And I asked him, I said, what's your outlet? What is your outlet? And at the time he was cycling, you know, I don't know if it was a still bike or, you know, something like that. But if you don't have, if you don't have an outlet, you know, uh, for me, it's, it's exercising of some kind. It's also family, you know, it's, it's family, it's dogs, it's pets. You need to have something else like in any job, right? If you're grinding in your job, your job is a, you know, WNBA or general manager, all those things. If you're just grinding at your job and you're going out like, I gotta work, I can't go home yet. And, um, you're, you're not going to bring much to the table. You can't handle it. You got, no one can handle it or, or maybe a handful. You know, I, I think of a few people I've worked for or maybe the, I don't know, Elon Musk or someone like that's got the brain power to grind like that all day, every day. But you still see them. They still go on vacation. They still get away and shut it down because they know they got to re-energize to come back at it. And if if you don't do that, you know, and, and for me, I find myself sometimes I don't go out to eat or I don't, you know, I, I use Instagram a lot just to see what's going on out there because I don't have time to go everywhere just to see what people are doing, you know, for better or worse, you know, and. Um, but if you don't have an outlet, you're going to flatline, you know, if you don't have fresh eyes on what you're doing and, um, fresh eyes and to see what's going on around you, you're going to miss, you know, we, we get spoiled out here, you know, um, year round, we can grow, I can grow carrots, beets, kales, all the broccolis, cauliflower. I can grow that all year long. I can grow lettuce all year long. Boise, I don't think you guys can do that. New York, I don't think they can. We just do had that. our first frost, so no, we yeah. cannot. My garden is done for the season. <laughs> right, and and the greenhouse isn't going to get it done because it's you know you get six degrees uh, increase with a greenhouse, it's not going to get it done. And New York's the same way. So to me, it's kind of funny out here if someone's saying you know farm fresh, whatever. It's like, duh, you're in California. If you're not using stuff from the farm, then what do, what are you doing? Because that same product that's in California is being shipped across the country. Why wouldn't you use it? You know, so I kind of got off there, but you need to have an outlet. You got to have something. You got to have painting, art, woodwork, uh, biking, swimming. You know, I, I know a lot of friends that are on bicycles now. They're doing bike rides for charity or, you know, they go ride a bike, you know, with other chef friends or whatever. You know, there's still competition there. It's it's work. It's sweat. It's, it's you know, you got to pay attention. So it's all those things that we're kind of all addicted to. Um, you know, the old days of, you know, work, go to the bar, you know, wake up, you know, go to bed when the sun's coming up and stuff. It just, it's just not sustainable anymore. I heard, um, I think it was on Instagram again, Eric Repair from La Bernadette in New York always one of the best restaurants in the world and i had never heard him say this before but he i don't know how long ago it was he had a, a realization that he needed to change how he was leading the kitchen going from you know very firm strong hand to you know these days you gotta you're gonna get more out of your people if you're adjusting your management style to them right some people can handle the harsh stuff some people cannot some people want the encouragement some people you know, Brian Bird, I, I mentioned again, he was even keeled. And that helped me so much in my career because I never wanted to disappoint him. So I would, he never yelled, he never screamed, he wouldn't throw things. Um, but he was just even keeled. He knew, like, I don't want to disappoint him. And I think he saw that in me, not that I never made mistakes, um, but he saw that in me. And that's why he was like, look, you know, and then he poured into me and said, look, you can, you can stay here if you want, but you've worked your way around the property. Go find somebody good to work for. and I'll make the phone call. I may know him. I may not. I'll make the phone call. And that's what I've told everybody that works for me moving forward. I said, look, if you, you tell me what you want to do, where do you want to be in a year, two years, five years, I'll call anybody and ask them if they've got a spot for you. And right now it's pretty easy because people are dying for hungry, good help in every field. It's not just, it's not just in culinary. So 
It's across um, the board. Yeah. But I think you know, well, well, as you talk about that too, and you you mention, you know, I think that whether it is um, in the culinary industry or if it's corporate America, that when you're looking at your capacity, we're humans, right? And we we yeah. do have only so much capacity that it is those self-aware leaders who are the best leaders, that they understand when they need to turn it off or whether it's a pause for, for 10 minutes or for 10 days so that they can recharge and re-energize, particularly if you're operating in a passion space, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you're operating in a passion space and you overdo it, then the thing that you love the most becomes something that you don't enjoy. And that's the last yeah. thing that you certainly want to, to see. Yeah. You know, Victor, as, as you're seeing this in the culinary industry, like I remember, in 2004, I moved to Minneapolis and I was sitting in corporate housing waiting for apartments and I was flipping channels on a very cold fall day. I saw you as a guest chef on Top Chef. And it was oh. the first time that I'd ever seen Top Chef. I think it maybe was the second year maybe of, of Top Chef. It was, it was year one, really. One, and, yeah. and now it's one of my favorite shows. But I wonder what, you know, as an industry insider, what you think about the explosion of cooking shows, um, celebrity chefs, um, and has that helped? Has it hurt? How has it changed or influenced the, the restaurant industry and chefs such as yourself? Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. And I, I don't, I don't know, have a, an easy answer for that. I know when I was teaching at the culinary school, you know, you used to have different buckets you'd put people in, you know, do you want to go pastry? Do you want to go fine dining, Michelin star? Do you want to go casual? And now there's this this media, there's this media, and it's been that way for probably 15 years or, or more. When we were in New York, Emerald was, well, maybe it was the first time. It might have been 2005. I remember Emerald Live on the on the bus stops everywhere, and you know the rumors were that you had to pay a hundred dollars to go sit and watch him film. And this is early on, and I remember people like saying he's a sellout, this and that. And I was like, well, wait a second. The guy grinded at Commander's Palace doing, I think it was a thousand covers, a shift or whatever. And now he's got an opportunity to support his family better. Does it mean he doesn't know how to cook? No, he didn't forget that. He'll never forget that. So here's an opportunity. So that's what I would say is this blue collar, you know, you used to say you're a cook or a chef and people would be like, you know, you know, they didn't think much of it. Now, now it's, it's, it's over the top. It's crazy. <laughs> You know, but great. You know, you got to take care of those advantages and and use those to do what you've always wanted to do. I think it's it's been really cool to watch Michael Mina expand his 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 business um, using hotels. Right They're they've got the resources. The gambling's got the resource, and you can use that money to fund your your dream projects and. That's great. You know, the cooking shows have, have been part of that. I think there's, you know, some very uh, talented people on there. I mean, there's no doubt Gordon Ramsay can cook, right? Um, you know, a lot of a lot of those guys, the judges that are on them, they're, you know, Tracy went on the show. I, I got to hear about that from a good friend of mine and her experience there. And she went in there and kicked all their butts, you know, and uh, way back when, probably 90. I don't know, maybe 98, Ron Siegel, who was a chef at Charles Knob Hills, a Michael Mina um, restaurant, went to Iron Chef Japan. And if you've never seen Iron Chef Japan, watch it, because it's not anything like what we're doing here. You, you have your helpers are Japanese. They don't speak English, barely. Um, you're not really familiar with the kitchen. You don't know what your any of your ingredients are. You get to bring, I think you got to bring two stocks and some other stuff with you um he went there and and he's you know he's awesome super creative super talented hard worker and he swept all the judges never been done when he went in there they were making fun of him oh this you know uh surfer from the united states what's he gonna do coming in here and he swept him never been done before swept all the judges so that was kind of my first experience with with competition shows um when I was at Julia's Kitchen at Copia, like you mentioned, we got this request to do Top Chef. Season one, no one knew what it was. We had no idea what they were going to do. They wanted to shut us down for two or three days. They grabbed a bunch of great chefs from Napa Valley, Ken Frank, Cindy Paulson, Doug Keen, 
um, Hero and Lisa, uh, uh, Damani and, and Sone, Hero Sone. Um, and we were all the judges for it and we hosted it. So I was, you know, running around trying to make sure we had all the ingredients, not knowing what was going on. Uh, the day before they came and, and dropped, I don't know how many million dollar non-disclosure statements to me. And I was just like, whoa, I started calling everybody. I'm like, I'm not signing any of this stuff. You know, I never, I don't think I'd ever seen a non-disclosure before, but of course, if someone said what happened, then, then all their time and energy on the show would be, be washed away. Um, Tom Colicchio was a judge. I knew him from doing a dinner with us at Aqua and then from Gramercy Tavern. So that was cool to see him and, and in a different light kind of a way. And, you know, just starting out, that was, I think his first, you know, cooking, cooking show. And um, yeah, it was, it was quite an experience. And then to see it, see it now, I don't know what season they're on, but you know, there's a lot of people that were on that show are still involved with the production of it. Leanne Wong, who I just missed her this event um, two Saturdays ago, she was out from Maui and just missed her at a f- fundraising event. But you know, it, like you said, it's this little bubble, it's really big, but you, you do these things, you do these events, you work for certain people and it's all connected dot, you know, um, Todd English in New York, Todd English in Vegas, Todd English, California, Charlie Palmer was another one where I spent time in Park Avenue, uh, where that was David Burke, but Charlie Palmer at, at his place in uh, New York, David Burke in New York. Well, people that I met at, there are now living in California, and, and Peter Armolino's got a plumed horse, one Michelin star down in Saratoga. That's fantastic. And that's meeting him through a friend, and we were both in New York and hanging out and enjoying food and, and getting you know, our outlet. Sometimes the outlet is just going and trying other people's food and, and watching it from the other side. So. Um, yeah, well, speaking of uh, trying others' food, you know, one of the things that um, we encourage our guests for Indulge Boise is to take food tours around the world. The culinary tourism is, is exploding around the world. A food tour is certainly a great way, your first or second day in a, in a new city to first to get to know the lay of the land, the geography of the city, so it doesn't feel as intimidating. And secondly, to find different restaurants, hopefully local restaurants off the beaten path that you wanna go back to and have a more extended culinary experience. And so I know for you as a chef and just following you on Instagram or in different places that you have traveled the world um, significantly to Mexico, um, India, I believe, like Europe. You mentioned before, like here in the US, that we're still behind Europe. You mentioned, uh, like the cooking show in Japan. Uh, and so what are some things that you've learned about the culinary industry and that you've incorporated into your culinary perspective through your international travels? Well, I, yeah, I think for me, it, you go to these other places and and some of them have a bunch of fancy equipment or whatever else, but you know, you go to, you go to India, for instance, and they took me to the seafood market and, you know, you're seeing people with baskets of fish on the dock. You know, the women were all carrying these baskets of fish on their head and you're going around and they're bidding on them and, and whatever. And, and just there was restaurateurs there. There was, you know, people that lived there. It, it, it comes down to the ingredients no matter where you go. You know, I think um, I've been to Lyon, France twice, which is supposedly, you know, the food mecca for for france and around the world yeah phenomenal like beautiful place beautiful food and it doesn't matter if you're at a there was a place the last time in brasserie georgia's which was like 800 seats it was enormous but the food they use like three kitchens to operate it and they just split the dining room and it was like three duplicate kitchens and you know the numbers they did were were crazy but the food was so good and then you go to a little bistro and the food was excellent you know um it comes down to the ingredients and the passion of the people creating it you know, uh, Thailand, who we were in, uh, we traveled with Michael Mina. We took over the, the restaurant at Shangri-La Hotel. That was probably, I don't know, 96, 90, no, 98, 99. And we were just talking about it too the other day. And, you know, you go there and we're trying to get all these ingredients, right? We're, we're going around the world to duplicate the aqua menu. And we're like, all right, we need day boat scallops, 1020 in size. You know, that's just, it's a sizing thing. And you get there and it's a frozen little tiny scallop and you're like, ah, what are we going to do here? You know, so you, you got to get creative. But, um, you know, and then we went from there up to Chiang Mai and, you know, we got in a, a tuk-tuk and just told the driver, take us, I mean, they could have taken us anywhere. Like, take us to your favorite place to eat. 
menu was zero English. We're just pointing at things. We had the, the local chef with us, but he was American. And so, you know, we're just, we're just, we were fish out of water for sure, but we got to try their, their food. You know, you go to the food markets in, in Singapore and it's the same, same thing, you know, um, really kind of a, a cool experience, but I think anywhere you go around the world, you said you, I think you went to Florence and Italy is, is magical as well. It's like you, you go to the, the marketplace and you just eat what's, what's there. Right. I mean, uh, done some cruises where I've got to go to some, Croatia. Like I never thought I'm going to go to Croatia. Dubrovnik, Croatia was some of the best seafood and squid ink rice and oysters that I've ever had. I'll never forget that. Um, so it's, you know, like you said it, whether it's, you know, Boise or Napa or Roner Park or New York, you kind of got to dive in. I think with what you're doing, it, it kind of is a shortcut for people that they don't have to waste time or, or trip, trip on a bad mistake and they can kind of see what you have to offer and, and guide people through because you don't usually have a lot of time. So, um, you know, tour guide's great. When I went to France the first time there was uh, work sent me and they sent me with a chaperone and said, you're going here and you're going here and you're going here, you know, in Paris, Léamy Louis and Le Coupeau, which was a place that was modeled after where I was working in San Francisco. And, you know, it's great to have that. So what you're doing is, 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 saving people a lot of time. Cause like, like we saw and we talked about in, in Manhattan, there's six restaurants on every block and they're not all good. You know, they're all trying, <laughs> but they're not all good. So, you know, you got hard earned money. You want to spend it wisely. So and that is so true. And it is, there is this really exciting moment in the culinary industry happening here in Boise. I'm curious for you being in California, what you were hearing of what's happening here in Boise, Idaho, the Treasure Valley. You know, we just had our first James Beard Award recipient um, and Chris Kamori who was our guest on our recent episode of Culinary Chats with Indulge Boise. Um, and then we actually had another chef um, who was nominated uh, for Amano, uh, an amazing Mexican restaurant in Caldwell, a tiny little um, bedroom community about 20 minutes from Boise as well. What, what are you hearing about what's happening in the culinary scene here in Idaho? You, you know, I, I hear bits and pieces of it. Um, you know, I think what I hear is that they don't like people from Cal. Everywhere I go, they like, we don't like Californians here. I was just in Nashville and they're like, all these Californians moving here. And I'm like, yeah, we're not so happy with ourselves either. But, uh, um, you know, I, I mean, it's, you hear, you hear at least these areas that are just booming, right? People are moving from other places are going there. I think people are more educated now than ever about what they're putting in their body, you know? And so to go to a place where, you know that the proteins haven't been manipulated or pumped full of hormones or mass produced where the, you know, the vegetables and stuff haven't been sprayed with different things. You know, throughout my career, I've heard all kinds of different stuff of tomatoes that are sprayed with salmon, whatever, so that they have a longer shelf life and things that are pumped with this. And they're not even labeling some of this stuff. So a place like Boise where, you know, I'm sure there's ranchers around that have, meat markets and farmers markets and you can get to the source real quick. It's a lot cleaner and purer than it is in, in almost everywhere. You know, I, I, my dad's dad had a cabin in Cook City, Montana. So it's right outside. It's right out. It's right outside the, uh, the East gate of Yellowstone and, and Grand Tetons are right there. And we drove through Idaho to get there. And I was, I don't even think I was double digits, but I will never forget. Never forget. First fish I ever caught, rainbow trout in, in Montana. I don't know if it was in a river there or a trout lake in Yellowstone, but what what a beautiful piece of the country. And, you know, I won't share that too much more because I don't think you guys want more people moving there, but I might. I might move there. We, t we talked about a, a new big resort going in there, but, um, you know, when, when you've got these things available to you as a chef, it makes life a lot easier. Tracy, I think it was Tracy that said, you know, you buy the best ingredients, the freshest ingredients and don't screw them up, cook them right, yeah. season them, put them on the plate, put, put what they're growing, you know, uh, put what they're growing right now on the plate. You know, if you yeah. buy something that's not in season, you have to manipulate it so much to get any flavor out of it. And already, you know, if like when I was in New York, you look at the stuff and it's been harvested so early because it's got to make it across the country the flavor's not there. You know, I remember eating a strawberry and going, 
this isn't mm -hmm. a strawberry, you know. And uh, again, that's that's knowing, being spoiled, having gardens growing up, having an apricot tree in the in the horse corral that we'd climb up and eat eat apricots till we're sick. I haven't found <laughs> a decent apricot in I don't know when. Now they have an aprium because apricots don't have any shelf life, so they're blending it with a plum because apricots they don't ripen once you pick them, so they're not, they're get, they might get softer, but there's not going to get any sugar. So it's one of the few things that, you know, you have to basically eat it off the tree or, or pretty close, you know, or you're harvesting it so early that it's rock hard and never gets any flavor. So it's yeah. things like that that you have to experience or you don't know. Tomato warm know. off the vine, you know, you don't know. Right. So. When you talked about kind of maybe some of the, the parallels um, or commonalities between Central California, where you grew up in Aptos and, and Idaho, and I think that there's a lot of parallels that you can draw upon. You know, I remember, Victor, when you um, became the executive chef at Julia's Kitchen at the Copia, and one of the things that you just saw in your eyes about how excited you were, the fact that you could go out the back patio mm -hmm. and pick some fresh ingredients, and that that was going to be the, the ingredients that you were putting into um, the menu um, for some of the dishes on your menu. And I think that that certainly is the case here in Idaho. We had a, a lot of conversations around this, is what's going on, the, the farm to table, all of those movements of what's going on. But we also understand the importance of sustainability and kind of the biodynamic farming. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about that and your perspective? I know that this is near and dear to your heart and yeah. really important for you. Yeah. Um, so we we took over Julia's Kitchen. I was working for um, Joaquim Spichal, a patina group in L.A., and Octavio Bicetta was the corporate chef at the time. And we took over the, the restaurant and flipped it in 48 hours. And so there was quick introductions with people. Jeff Dawson was a gardener. He'd started the whole program there, and we didn't know what biodynamics were. So Jeff put a little bit of information out there, and, you know, we're, we're kind of being punks, and we're like, how do you know it's any good? And, you know, there was stone fruit trees there, and I think it was a peach or something. And he goes, try, try the peach off that tree there. These are only two-year-old trees. Maybe they were three at the time because they got them in the ground before opening. And go to the farmer's market, go to your store, go anywhere else and see if which one's better. He, he wasn't going to sit there and lecture us on, you know, Gunter Steiner who came up with biodynamics and all the processes that go behind it where they take uh, horns from a from a cow and they put biodynamic prep in it and they bury it in the ground and it's based on the looter cycle. I mean, it's very complex to some degree, um, but he's, he said, you know, just try it. You tell me. You know, and, and it was very exciting to be there because once we got to know each other and, and we realized that we wanted to be flexible with the menu based on whatever they were going to bring us, it turned into a game. So certain times mm -hmm. a year, springtime, they would bring us 10 to 15 cases of fava beans a day. And so, it, you know, we would just sit there and roll our eyes like, what are we going to do with all this? Because it's a cover <laughs> crop. It was for decoration. It was for protection from things to go at other plants. Um, there was over a hundred different types of uh, tomatoes, sweet peppers and chilies. And, you know, what do you do with, I don't know, 50 pounds of hot peppers a week? Like you can only make so much salsa that's going to light somebody on fire, but it was just this fun game and trying them and, and what we were going to do with them. So that was, that was addicting, you know, and, and to learn. And those guys were, that whole crew was so passionate. So it, it really fed off of us. And then we would have them come in. We'd like, they want to see what we did with it, right? For a farmer to be able to see what you do with their product is pretty cool. Like a lot of farmers, I mean, in Boise, yeah, probably can happen. San Francisco, maybe, maybe they get out from their farm that's up here or in the Central Valley and go to the restaurants that they've been selling, you know, duck or chicken or lamb to, but not very often. They don't have time for it. You know, the animals yeah. barely sleep, so they got to they gotta keep going. So it was a fun back and forth. It was, it was really a neat place, you know. Was proud of what we did. There. Yeah, we. It was a big game, you know, and and it was fun. You know, it was fun to show them through what we created how we appreciated what they were doing. You know, and um, it makes it it makes it easy. You know, it's in season. It was just harvested. Guests could go out there, wander through, and then come inside and have a you know English pea soup or fava soup or you know this carrot salad from all the carrots that were just pulled out of the ground that morning. You know, that's, that's pretty unique, you know, and, and it wasn't everything, you know, but, but it was a lot, it was a lot of it, you know, and that's pretty cool situation. Well, one more question before we get to the final course, um, Victor, you know, you mentioned this earlier about like, you know, again, growing up 13, 14 year old, um, starting to enter into the culinary industry. 
and now look where you are and that that is actually a prospect. You can have a career in the, the culinary industry as opposed to just it being a part-time job or a summer job. Yeah. And that's something that a lot of people here in Boise are talking about. Chris Kamori talked about it at Ken, really important for him, sustainable wages, making sure that his, his team members know that they can have a career. There's the Wilder Hospitality Group that has several restaurant concepts that are phenomenal here in Boise is the same. They're opening up restaurants so that they know that a, a team member has a prospect to work their way up from a dishwasher to yeah. general manager of either a singular restaurant or all of the restaurants, which I think it feels like that's a little bit of a pivot in the restaurant industry. What else, what are some of the other trends that you're starting to see in the culinary industry? Yeah, I think, I think, uh, I saw, I mean, what Tracy in San Francisco was doing in meant like insurance for the staff way before it was mandatory. And there's a lot of things now that they're doing, but I think, you know, one, because it's difficult to find staff, but two, because it's the right thing to do, they're taking care of employees better. Like it's always been this kind of dysfunctional family, I guess you would say. And, and you work together, you're pushing each other, you're, you know, barking at each other, um, you know, and then everybody go out afterwards. It's all forgotten the next day. It's all forgotten. Here we go again, you know, but there's also, you know, stuff where people would throw away your stuff or sabotage you because they want to move up. There's always little games like that. I think there's less of that now. Um, people are realizing you can work together, makes things a lot easier. So I think, and, and as restaurateurs, I mean, you can't, you can't do, honestly, you can't do what used to happen. You know, there's, yeah. there's a lot of laws in place. And I think everybody knows in the back of their mind, if you're, if you're trying to be cheap with somebody, it's, you know, they go back seven years and they're going to recover that. So it just doesn't, it's not the right thing to do. It doesn't make sense. Don't do it. You know, one of the things I like about where I am now is they've got amazing medical benefits for everybody. They've got, you know, very good wages and they, they take care of everybody. They're like, you know, look, every quarter there's incentives for everybody. There's over 2000 employees there now. So they're not just taking care of their tribe. They're taking care of their tribe you know, that runs the operation for them. And I think that's, it's attractive to people. Uh, people know it's not going anywhere. I think that's the hesitation for a lot of people. You know, COVID to me was, was kind of scary. You know, you watched the, the country shut down. They were kind of controlling businesses. They said, you know, here you go, do to go food or whatever. Well, especially in California, you can't use styrofoam or whatever. So now you've added $2 a meal with a bag and everything else. And if you didn't do to go already, then you can't pass the $2 on to anybody. So it was really easy for people to say, you know, just do takeout. It doesn't work that way. That's not your model. It's not what you're set up to. You don't have the supplies. The supplies weren't available. So it, it, I think it was really eye-opening for a lot of people. I think getting through it was was amazing you know for for a lot of these people i know people shut down they had three they went down to two went down to one went back um but i think you know the more that people take care of their staff to the best of their ability you can't take i don't want to get political again but you can't take care of the staff to the point where no one has a job you cannot mm -hmm. take care of them to the point where the business goes bankrupt because that doesn't help anybody so you got to figure out what what you can do and just be honest with them. I think that's the biggest thing is people don't like to be misled and hear rumors and you know we heard it's for sale. Oh no, it's not for sale. You know we just have these people touring the property every week. You know every other day. Well, that's that's for sale. You know, um, so you know honesty, taking care of them the best that you can, letting them know where you're at. You know, I think you saw some amazing things with people that maybe couldn't afford it working working anyway working saying, you know, just get, get back to me when you can. I know that, you know, it's a struggle. So it's never been an easy industry. I think they say that the, the margin of a good, you know, successful restaurant is like 7%. So wow. you imagine if, if it's 7% and then anything happens, fires up here, an earthquake, uh, you know, floods, hurricane, whatever, whatever the natural disaster that is in your area that comes through and shuts things down for a day, two days, that's a big deal. Yeah, you've got product that doesn't get used. You've got staff to pay. Payroll doesn't go away. So um, it's tough. It's a tough business, but it's been great. Like you said, India, Singapore, Thailand, all over the Mediterranean, uh, you know, been able to provide for my family, you know, and it's, it's 
it's what I do. You know, even if you try to get away from it, it pulls you back in. So, yeah, no way. And it brings you joy for sure. And, you know, I think that like at first it's remarkable 7% how few people understand the economics of the restaurant industry, right? And these, you know, folks that are working in restaurants and their families mm -hmm. uh, are immersed in it for 24 hours a day. It's, it's, it puts a lot of a burden on everyone. And um, is the, one of the reasons it's important for us to understand why sometimes menu prices, they may not feel great, right? But in order to make sure that you have access to great restaurants is we have to be willing to pay for fresh local resource ingredients, to pay for talented chefs and staff and customer service and all those different things. Um, so really important things. You know, Victor, I, uh, last, or this past January, I went to Park City and Sundance, the Sundance Film Festival. Mm. And there was a documentary called Food and Country. Um, if you have not seen it and you guys are watching this, check check it out. It was a great documentary and talking about the challenges inside of COVID, but even that preceded that here in the in the U.S. around you know the quick and cheap food, how that yeah. has had this negative impact on uh, the quality of food and sourcing ingredients. Um, and, and a lot of different dynamics and certainly has had an influence on the experience that the farmers, ranchers and restaurant tours had over the last few years. So fascinating uh, flick for you all to check out. This has been so much of a soulful conversation with, with Victor Scargo. He's given us a lot of food for thought. We're going to take a quick pause for a moment and then we'll be back with Victor on the final course. Welcome back to Culinary Chats with Indulge Boise. I'm Angela Taylor, host and owner of Indulge Boise. You know, we're here with incredible Victor Scargill, um, sharing some stories about Victor's culinary journey uh, and his perspective on what's happening in the culinary world. Victor, um, you know, I want to kind of dig beyond just the, your culinary journey to find out a little bit more about you with some of these final course questions. Uh, share your first food memory, maybe a, a moment from your past where food played a starring role. Uh, wow. Um, I, guess, I mean, I guess it would have been that the restaurant that I worked at briefly before going to the greenhouse restaurant, the farm, the grape steak. So they would you know, bring the steaks out on a wood board and set them on the table and we'd go up there and, you know, I was grilling them, you know, and uh, it was nothing fancy or whatever, but it was kind of the first, first time I was cooking. And then, you know, you go back and of course it's great because it's your parents. So, you know, that getting that, that gratification that, you know, you, you did something for them and they're happy with it. So, it, you know, that, yeah. that sticks with me. Well, for me, you know, one of the things that I noticed the difference between someone who cooks just to eat when, you know, you're at home with your family, a home chef and talented chefs as yourself was when we were in New York again, there are three experiences that just blew um, the mind of, of my friends and I. One was we went to a Yankees game and this was this preceded 9-11, right? So we were able to take our own food in. And you and, and your buddy Brad, I think, um, made sandwiches. He made a pesto chicken sandwich that was just phenomenal. We're like, okay, like if I was making a sandwich for a baseball game, it would have been very basic, some, some mayo, mustard, and some, some turkey on, on some bread. Yeah. So that was one. Uh, the other was when we went to Great Adventure. To a theme park, and oh, you guys said that you know, as opposed to eating the food at the theme park, that you 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 and Brad were going to cook dinner or cook lunch, and we went on the side of the road out of our uh, caravan, and y'all made the most incredible meal, uh, and just watching you work again out of a van was pretty incredible. And then the last one was um, when you cooked us a steak dinner. Uh, at your uh, place in New York City. And just like we had the slices, like it was just like completely different than anything else that we had had in, at somebody's home. And so thank you for um, several food memories that have been etched in, in my journey for sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm curious for you, like we talk a lot about comfort food. When we think about our family and our friends, Thanksgiving is right around the corner. Um, comfort food, so you can feel like you're at home. That there's there's love in the air. What is um, your perspective about comfort food, and what is your own comfort food that you go to? Um, well, I, I think comfort food 
you know, I'm going to go again to where we live. We're spoiled. So comfort foods, what's in, what's in season, what's here. You know, I think of this time of year when the temperature drops, you know, it's, it's a lot easier. I would say, you know, summertime comfort foods off the barbecue, whatever it is, you know, wintertime is something braised, you know, or, or maybe a pasta, um, short ribs. I think about a lot. I've been talking about those a lot lately and putting them on the menu, the new spot and, and how do you do that? And everybody's got short ribs. So how do you, how do you make it different? How's it a different cut? Um, but just comfort uh, food, I think of as good, good, wholesome food. It doesn't have to be super fancy. You know, I think go back to what Tracy used to tell us and me is, you know, best food cooked right, seasoned right. You can put it on a plate, you know, it's a starch, two veg and, and your protein and some sauce and done. You know, you don't have to get it overly complicated. And, and that's usually what can get anybody to really relax, even in a you know fancy place. Like I'm not the one that wants to go to a 10 course meal and suit and tie. And, and, but when you go somewhere like that and you get a dish, that's just, it's not over the top. It's simple, clean, um, well, food men, fem, Dan, restaurant, Danielle in New York, they served us a salmon tail. So the tail piece of the salmon, which is sometimes you're not even going to serve, you're not even going to use it, but they put it and displayed it in the, beautiful oval copper pan and it it was mind-blowing and we're all just sitting there going they just gave us the tail piece of the salmon and we're we're like, yeah. like thank you so much you know like a piece that you would normally use for chopping up for tartare or something else and you know it, so it, very comfortable very but it was it was mind-blowing that that's you know restaurant danielle is that's that's uh, you know the godfather of, of food in, in the world too and to get the tail piece of the salmon was like comforting and then you're like wait a second like that's that's a piece we don't usually use we just need to rethink what we're doing here to get maximum usage so that was pretty fun well you know for for those of us home cooks uh what are three ingredients that uh you would recommend that we make sure we have three ingredients kosher salt salt really basic kosher salt Every day I'm going through the kitchen tasting stuff, water for cooking broccoli for the employees in the dining room. Uh, they're making soup, whatever else, and they haven't tasted it. Or they've just randomly thrown some salt in there. It's like, did you taste that? Did you put salt? Oh yeah, I put salt in it, but did you taste it? You know, and so salt's one of those things a lot of people get really worried about, but if it's used right and throughout the cooking process you're going to need a lot less than waiting until the end of the cooking process and then having to load it all up and then it's going to be salty um ingredient uh second ingredient wow this is a tough question I'm, three ingredients i think acid um and not going to be too specific on it whether it's uh an acidic wine white wine or a lemon or vinegar to give food that brightness, um, there's lots of different ways to get there, but acid, um, uh, number three, um, uh, pork belly. Mm. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Bacon pork belly in one way, shape or form. No, I, um, an ingredient like there's not one I'm trying to think of a spice or something. I mean, I love fennel, so fennel seed, or no, any variation of fennel. Um, I, I, I bought fennel this morning to make some butternut squash soup. So um, I love. I, so maybe fennel. Okay. So, so some kosher salt, um, some sort of like vinegar or wine, acid. acid, um, yep. acid. All right, and uh, fennel. Love it. Love fennel. it. Well, well. Last question for you, Victor. Um, you, you again have had an incredible journey. What is the most surprising or unexpected thing that you've learned about food and cooking throughout your career that is some advice that you can use in any aspect of your life? Oh, um, well, I think something I've learned, I mean, maybe it's, maybe it's the experience with my boss when I was in high school where he was kind of said, Hey, you know, yeah, you deserve more money, but quit pouting, you know, and, um, the world's rough, can be rough. It can chew you up no matter what industry you're in, no matter how much money you have or whatever else. And so, um, there's not always going to be someone there to pick you up. So you kind of got to, you know, kind of got to suck it up and, and again, maybe go, go to whatever your outlet is, right? If, if you're, 
if you're feeling down or whatever, what, what haven't you done that's your outlet? Did you exercise? Did you go out to eat? Did you do yoga? Did you paint? Did you do woodwork? What, what is it? And uh, you got to kind of pick yourself up because no one, very rarely is someone else going to do it for you, right? You've been in big corporate situations with powerhouses and they want results. Yeah. And that applies at home. That applies at work. That applies everywhere. There's no, there's no breaks, right? Um, so, you know, figure yeah. out what, what your outlet is. And, and when you're getting down, just go through the check boxes. What, what am I not doing? That's got me in this, in this funk so I can get myself out of it. Cause as soon as you can figure out how to get yourself out of the funk, uh, it's a big help. Yeah. It's a big help. Yeah. You know, uh, my business partner with our consulting company where we do leadership development, we talk about that all the time for leadership development is um, circumstances will always happen. Yeah. Be powerful anyway. Right. And so inside of that, how can you bring value? At the end of the day, it's about what value you can bring. And when you bring value, then you have much more power and influence to change things. For right. Sure. Yeah, exactly. So, Awesome. Exactly. Well, Victor, um, are there any special projects that you're currently working on and where can our uh, YouTube viewers find you? So, um, yeah, I'm currently at Great Resort and Casino in Roner Park. We're in the middle of a, a massive expansion. So we've got a, a restaurant that's going to be opening up um, almost thir like 32 days away. We're taking over a new concept for a Bistro 101. It's going to be a fun breakfast gastro pub spot. Uh, We've aligned with some local brewers and got some exciting stuff happening there. Uh, rooftop restaurants coming down the road, a large amphitheater. Um, we've got Tony's. We've got 630 Parks. So there's a lot going on. We've got a lot, very talented team. We're exciting to, excited to expand that, but um, there's a lot of projects happening. So we've been able to partner as well with uh, the Great and Rancheria Tribe, and they've got a nice garden across the way that we're starting to really utilize. So that's exciting as well. So it's kind of going full circle back to Copia or even growing up in Aptos with apricots in the tree is, you know, we've got a partner across the street that's got uh, three acres of planted stuff. So it's, it's an exciting time for us. It's an exciting time for the, the tribe. And uh, we're really looking forward to getting people in to see what we're doing because uh, we're, we're working hard and we're excited. That's excellent. So we will make sure that we have the websites uh, and the information about Great Resort and Casino in our show notes here on YouTube. And we all will have to check it out. Make sure you head down to uh, Napa Valley, check it out. Um, tell Victor that uh, Culinary Chats with Indulge Boise sent you. Uh, and, and Victor, thank you so much for, for joining us on the show. But even more than that, for um, being somewhat of an inspiration for me, some of that was eating at McDonald's and eating bagels on a regular basis in New York City, of exposing me to what um, really being a foodie is like. Uh, and it really has changed my trajectory and, and I hopefully has impacted those guests that have been able to join us on our Indulge Boise tours as well. So thanks for joining us today and, and sharing some of your wisdom and some food for thought. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. And I'm, I'm glad we've gotten you away from McDonald's, even though we, we once in a while will go down the in and out of McDonald's road. It's uh, yeah. it's good not to do it on a regular basis. So I'm glad I was part of getting you away from that. So absolutely. absolutely. Well, you know, I was giving back to the economy with J.R. Simplot supplying all those fries to McDonald's. Yeah. I was trying to give back to this ecosystem for sure. Perfect. But excellent. Well, this has been another episode of Culinary Chats with Indulge Boise. I'm your host, Angela Taylor. Thank you so much for joining us here on the YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure that you subscribe. Hit that subscribe button down below. We have some great uh, guests coming up on Culinary Chats and continue to talk about what's happening in the culinary industry across the globe and certainly here in the Treasure Valley and in Boise specifically. So thank you once again for joining us on Culinary Chats with Indulge Boise. Until next time, hope you enjoy this food for thought. This is Victor Scargill with uh, Great Resort and Casino on Culinary Chats. A great experience being able to talk about decades ago what we experienced as, as food uh, foodies, food people. We're all kind of uh, in that environment one way or another. So it was great to um, think about, you know, being asked the questions, being thinking about how I ended up in this spot. 
and what drives me and, and keeps me going in this industry. So it was a great experience. Looking forward to going back and seeing other culinary chats and what's coming up on future chats with uh, Indulge Boise. Thank you so much.